are our uh, seminars. So today we are very glad to have uh, Rafael Bazal Plasas and come back to give us uh, her talk. And his title is on the spectral decompositions of the Jackie Rallis trace formula and the gangrose Prasad conjecture for unitary groups. Okay. So uh, thank you, Lei, for the introduction. So let me um Okay, and thanks also for the invitation, of course. Uh, very glad to be, to come back to be speaking at this new uh, Zoom version of your seminar. So today uh, I will talk on a recent paper, which is a joint work with Pierre-Henri Chaudoir and Michel Zidor, whose aim uh, is to uh, complete the proof of the gang gross prasad conjecture for unitary groups. And as the title indicates, uh, this is done through uh, analyzing or computing uh, the spectral side, or more precisely, some part of the spectral side of the so-called jack Eralis trace formula. So I will explain what is exactly the problem later, but let me start by setting some notations. So E over F will be a quadratic extension of number fields. We denote by C the non-trivial Galois automorphism of this extension, by A bar the Adel ring of F, and uh, by eta E over F the quadratic Idel class character associated to this uh, extension. So these are my basic notation for the fields. And then we need to introduce uh, groups. So for H, uh, non-degenerate emission form of rank N, I will introduce two groups. So U index H will be the product of the unitary group of H and of the unitary groups of a slight extension of this emission form, where we add to it uh, a one-dimensional non-degenerate emission line, let's say generated by a, a vector of emission norm one. So this is the form I am adding. So this is a product of two unitary groups of rank n and uh, n plus one, respectively. And u h prime would denote the small unitary group, unitary group of h that we embed in the product uh, in a diagonal way. Okay. So now let uh, sigma be a cuspidal automorphic representation. Uh, let's start. Of u h. Uh, then we can associate to this uh, automorphic representation basically two invariants. So the first one is uh, an automorphic period associated to this subgroup QH prime, denoted by pi H, and it suggests the linear form sending a cus form in sigma to its integral over the subgroup QH prime, where this notation, uh, where I have a group into brackets, it will mean for me the adelic points mod the rational. So this is the first invariant, and uh, for the second invariant, it's more convenient to first introduce the quadratic base change of sigma that I will denote by capital Pi. And uh, so this quadratic base change with respect to this extension E over F, and then so it becomes an uh, automorphic representation of this group G, which is a product of GLN and GLN plus one, but over E. And since I will consider all my group as defined over F, I take the restriction of scalars. Yeah. And uh, the existence of this base change is now known in general, thanks to the work of Mock and Kaleta, Minges, Shin, and White. Okay, and decompose as a tensor product of two automorphic representations, pi n and pi n plus one of GLN and GLN plus one. So the second invariant we associate to sigma is the rankin selbergel function of this pair that I will denote for short as Ls of pi. And I insist that this is a completed L function. And so with this, I can now state our first main result, which is the gang gross conjecture. So the following is the conjecture of gang gross And it says that assuming that the base change is generic, then the following should be equivalent. So first, the central value of the Rekitzelberger function is non-zero. And secondly, the fact that uh, for some emission form H prime, so not necessarily the original one, but 
still of rank n, and the cuspidal representation sigma prime of the group, the big group associated to H prime, so U H prime, which is in the same L packet as sigma. So uh, in the situation at ends, it just means that it shares the same base change. It has the same base change, quadratic base change as sigma, uh, on which the gain gross process period is non-zero. So this is the conjecture. And uh, so a few remarks is that uh, this was already proved in uh, many cases. So first by Wei Zhang, uh, there is a result of Wei Zhang who proved this using a comparison of simple relative trace formulas that we'll discuss next. Uh, but under my local assumptions coming from the uh, use of a simple versions of these trace formulas here, yeah. And most of these local assumptions were subsequently lifted by Ang Shui and myself, but we still needed to assume that at least capital Pi, the base change is supercuspidal at one place. And then, so recently in a joint work with Yifeng Liu, Wei Zhang and Xin Wen Zhu, we have pushed this method further and, and established the conjecture when uh, now the base change is uh, only assumed to be globally cuspidal. And finally, in a slightly different direction, which is not completely related to this talk, uh, using automorphic descent, one of the two implications of the conjecture was proved. Uh, so first by Ginsburg, Jiang, and Alice, and Ichino and Yamana, when uh, the sigma prime appearing in two is generic, and then in general by Dua Jiang and Leizang. Okay, so this is the first main result. There is a second one, which is sometimes called the refined gan gross pattern conjecture, which is due to Ichino Ikeda and Neil Harris. And it takes the form of a, a precise formula relating the two previous invariants. So let me go a bit quickly on this because I will not exactly present the proof, but. Uh, so it, this time we have to assume that sigma, the uh, cuspidal representation is tempered everywhere, meaning that its local components are all tempered. And then we have a formula of this form. So let me discuss this uh, a bit. So here phi is a pure tensor in the cusp form sigma. This is, and so in the left-hand side, you have the square of the module of the gain gross process period. Whereas on the right-hand side, so you have a certain quotient of L functions, special value of L functions. So you see appearing uh, in the denominator, the central value of the rankin selberg L function and in the numerator, the adjoint L function of sigma at one. And here you have the product of AQL functions and uh, times a product of local factors, which are certain normalized local periods that I will not try to define here, because we will not need them, but let me just say that it's uh, purely defined purely locally. And there is another global ingredient with an interesting one here, which is S sigma. This is a finite group associated to sigma that could to be the centralizer of the global L parameter of sigma, but this global L parameter is not strictly speaking well defined, but uh, in fact, we can still define S sigma in terms of the base change. And I will explain a little bit more of this below. So this is a formula that has been conjectured by Chino Ikeda and Neil Harris, and this is also part of our result. Okay, so uh, again, this was known when pi is cuspidal uh, by uh, this work with Yifeng Liu, Wei Zhang, and Xin Wen Zhu after Wei Zhang and work of Wei Zhang and Ang Shui. And also up to an unspecified algebraic numbers, algebraic numbers, sorry, under some arithmetic assumption on sigma. And this is a result of Harald Grobner and Jilin. And my second remark is how you describe this S sigma in terms of the base change. So recall that the base change capital Pi decomposes as a tensor product of automorphic representations of GLN and GLN plus one. And if it's generic, then we can uh, decompose pi n and pi n plus one as uh, isobaric sums of cuspidal automorphic representations of some general linear groups over E. 
by, that are denoted by ij here. Yeah? And these uh, cuspular representations are conjugate self dual uh, of certain prescribed signs. So I will explain later what this means. And they are, these are distinct also, this is important. And uh, so how you describe now the, the, yeah. the <laughs> final group S sigma in terms of this, this is just a product of z copies of z over two z. Yeah. And there is one copy for each cuspidal representation appearing in this isobaric decompositions. So you see that this term is just a power of two and actually the exponent is just the rank, so to speak of the Levy from which uh, capital pi is induced. So this is something that will appear again later. And let me just remark that when pi is cuspidal, this group is always of cardinality four, so that it does not really depend on sigma. And uh, so this term is really uh, making a difference, uh, starting to make a difference when pi is not, the phase change is not cuspidal. Okay, so these are the two main results. And now I would like to present uh, ideas from the proof. And, uh, so as I already said, we are using the so-called Jackie Rallis trace formulas, which is an approach proposed by Jackie and Rallis to attack this uh, gain gross conjecture by comparing two relative trace formulas. So um, I'm going to now discuss what are these relative trace formulas uh, in some length. But uh, for this first, I need to introduce more notation because you will have, so we already introduced the unitary side. Now we have, we'll have another side, which is the general linear side. So from now on, I will denote by so GK, the group GLK of E restricted to F and G prime K will denote GLK, but of F. So you have two kind of general linear groups. And also it will be convenient for me to use this notation. So eta prime of k will denote the composition of eta e over f with the determinant to the power k minus one, seen as a automorphic character of glk over f, so this group g prime k. And so using this notation, I can now define three groups. So g is gn times gn plus one. So this we already encounter. This is the group on which the base change of sigma was living. And we also consider two subgroups of this group G. So H is uh, just GLN over K, over E, sorry, that we embed again diagonally in the product and G prime is the product of GLN and GLN plus one over F, which embeds naturally in G again. And to be completely uh, precise, we also need to consider this uh, quadratic character of the group G prime, which is a tensor product of this eta prime of N and eta prime of N plus one. So from this, I can now uh, introduce in a formal way what are the relative trace formula of Jackie and Rallis. These are roughly obtained by expanding in two different ways the following expressions, uh, where uh, we are integrating so the automorphic kernels of two test functions, f prime and fh, on my two groups, g and uh, over a product of two subgroups. So for on the unitary side, we will integrate on twice so in both variable on the subgroup UH prime and on the linear side, you will integrate one variable over H and the other one over G prime, uh, twisted by eta prime. And see, I have put the quotation marks here because this is uh, as usual uh, with these trace formulas. The problem is that we want to consider certain expressions, but these are not convergent in general. And so, um, I will explain in the next slide how to circumvent this difficulty after uh, the work of Zidor. But before doing so, let me just uh, uh, explain that so for technical, but uh, actually important reasons, it will be better to work with short spaces rather than usual space of test functions. And so I, I'm going now to recall quickly the definition. So I'm going to denote this space of test functions by so S for Schwarz of the adelic points of G or UH. And these are defined as take, by taking the tensor product of the usual space of test functions at finite places. And at the Archimedean places, so where I denote by infinity the product of the Archimedean completions of F, you take the 
so-called short space, which is uh, in a nutshell, the space of smooth functions with uh, invariant derivatives that are decaying uh, faster than the, than the inverse of any polynomial. Okay, so this will be my space of these functions from now on. And I can now start to discuss in more details what are these J.K. Riley trace formulas. So the first thing is how to make sense of the previous divergent expressions. So I'm going to be not completely uh, precise at this point, but let me just explain the idea. So we'll fix a minimal parabolic subgroup P0 of UH prime. So this is the small unitary group. And I'm going to denote by Bn plus one, the standard Borel subgroup of Gn plus one, so which is just Gln plus one, but over E. And by A0 and An plus one, the maximal split quotient of pi zero and pn plus one respectively. So uh, now uh, if you take t, so t will be a parameter in this uh, real vector spaces obtained by tensoring. So x lower star will denote the group of co-characters of either a zero or a n plus one. So these two vector spaces are, so to speak, the real Lie algebras of a zero and a n plus one. And if this capital T is sufficiently dominant, we introduce, so following uh, Archer, but maybe also Langlands, uh, characteristic functions of some uh, compact subsets of the uh, automorphic quotients, so compact modular center actually. And these subsets are usually called truncated Siegel domains, and I will denote these subsets by F uh, T with a superscript indicating the group on which this is the truncation. And now the idea followed by Zidor is relatively simple. It consists in taking the previous expressions and uh, truncating the integrals in one of the variables using these uh, characteristic functions. So I just wrote the definitions here. So this is the same expression as before, except you have plugged into the integral these two characteristic functions. So in the first one, you are applying the characteristic function to H2. So you are truncating on H2. And the second integral, you are only truncating in G prime N, where G prime N is the component of G prime living in GLN. OK, so this is some way of truncating. And what uh, Zidor has proved is that uh, first, these expressions are convergent. And moreover, as T goes to infinity in the positive chamber and uh, in some unprecise way sufficiently far from the walls, then these two uh, distributions are asymptotic to exponential polynomials whose uh, purely polynomial parts are constant. And this allows to define uh, in a natural way now regularization. So we define gh and i of my test function fh and f prime to be these constant terms. So we have distributions now, and we can look to uh, two different ways of expanding them. And this is also something that was done by Zidor. And I will now discuss this, uh, each of the two expansions in turn, because we need them. So the first one is the geometric expansion. So it's convenient to introduce this uh, First annotation, so we denote by a h or curly a the uh, geometric invariant theoretic, or sometimes also called coarse quotients, of my two big groups u h and g by the left and right actions of so u h uh, prime on one end and on the other end h on the left and g prime on the right. So these are really uh, parametrizing, not exactly the geometric orbits for these left and actions by left and right translations, but um, some coarse notion of geometric orbits where two orbits are considered the same if their closure, uh, Zeiss closure meet. Okay, so you have this notion, which is general. And uh, for me, it will be uh, convenient to implicitly identify now elements in this uh, GIT quotients, OH or O, with their pre-image 
in the big groups UH or G. So this will really consist in a um, number of orbits, of geometric orbits in these groups. So possibly infinitely many, depending on the elements we are considering in AH or A, but we can call them, and I would call them for simplicity, just coarse orbits. These are the coarse orbits, and they might be actually, in this case, uh, relatively badly behaved, but actually they are uh, very nice on some open, dense subset of regular semi-simple elements that will denote by uh, superscript RS. And uh, more precisely, in this regular semi-simple locus, the corresponding coarse orbits are just torsors for the corresponding actions and even always a trivial torsor on the linear side. So these are really very well behaved there. Okay, so now I can state a uh, result of Zidor. So it says that now our two previous regularized distribution can be expanded and decompose as sum of distributions indexed by these coarse orbits, the uh, rational points, so the rational coarse orbits, the ones that are defined over F, and into distributions that are denoted by J, O, H, and I, O, where these two distributions are uniquely determined by the fact that they are supported on the adelic points of the corresponding coarse orbits, right? But so this uniquely determine them in terms of these decompositions, but of course, uh, actually we have more for the regular semi-simple one, because then we can describe explicitly what are these distributions. These are essentially just regular uh, relative orbital intervals. So uh, more precisely, these are given by these formulas, where as you see, you are essentially integrating the test functions over the coset, so the orbit of uh, so the adelic coset when there is a rational point in the coarse orbit which is always the case in the linear on the linear side but not always on the uh, unitary side because the torso might be non trivial anyways it's just given by this and these are really uh, integrating over the orbit okay. so this is for the geometric expansion and now I would like to discuss the spectral, what uh, Zidor did with the spectral expansion. So for the spectral expansion, I, I call this the coarse spectral expansion. This is, as we'll see, this is not completely sufficient for the application. We need to go a bit further and this will be the subject. I mean, this is the subject of the work I'm going to talk about. Anyway, so uh, this, it's the first approximation and we need it. So let me explain what this says. So I need again to introduce two of the notations. So let me denote by a uh, gothic X of UH or gothic X of G. Um, the sets of uh, cuspidal data in these two groups, for these two groups. So let me just recall what this means. These are uh, equivalence classes of pairs M pi, where M is a Levy subgroup and pi is the isomorphism class of a cuspidal representation of this level. And uh, it's equi equivalent to pairs are, say to be equivalent is they are the same up to conjugacy and, and ramified twists. So this is something that sometimes is called uh, inertia class in the local setting. But I think the uh, terminology in the global setting is, is these are called just cuspidal data. Okay, so now there is a decomposition of the L2 spaces of the automorphic quotients associated to this uh, cuspidal data. So this is called, sometimes called the coarse spectral decomposition. This is due to Langlands, but it's not to be confused with the full spectral decomposition, which is more, uh, which is uh, yes, deeper. And it just says that you can decompose these L2 spaces into uh, Hilbert directions of pieces that are indexed by cuspidal data, so chi h or chi. And roughly speaking, what these pieces are, these are the space of L2 functions, which are uh, spectrally supported on the corresponding cuspidal datum. 
uh, but I will not say more about this. But this is the, so these are actually equivalent distributions with respect to the group actions. And therefore the kernel, the automorphic kernels of our test functions, F prime and FH, they will correspondingly decompose as uh, sums of kernels indexed by this hospital data also. Where these kernels are now describing the action of our test functions on each of these pieces. Okay, so uh, I can now using this state the second uh, uh, or the third result of Zidor, which is a core spectral expansion. And this says uh, that if you now go back and redefine the same expression as before, same truncated integrals as before, but replacing the kernels by this uh, projection of the kernels onto uh, one cuspidal datum, so chi h or chi. And so this is on the unitary side and this is on the linear side. Then you get again uh, distributions which depends on the parameter t, which are asymptotic in the same sense as before to exponential polynomials. Uh, again, with a purely polynomial part, which is constant. And therefore we can uh, now define uh, two new distributions indexed by cuspidal datum, gkh and ik, by defining them to be the constant terms of these exponential polynomials. And we get decompositions of the original distributions, jh and i, as sums of distributions indexed by this cuspidal data. So this is the core spectral expansion. And, uh, okay, so now I can summarize what, what we have so far. So we have a first, of a first version of a relative trace formulas of Chucky and Rallis. Uh, and these are the following identities. So where FH and F prime are Schwarz, Schwarz functions on UH or G. And so uh, these identities are obtained by, a, a, I mean, by the two different expansions of this distribution, J, H, and I. And so on the left-hand side, you have the geometric expansions, which are given as the compositions in terms of coarse orbits. And on the spectral side, you have the composition of the distributions in terms of cuspidal data. So now I would like to explain uh, on this slide how, uh, following the original idea of Jacqueline Rallis, you can compare these two uh, trace formulas. And the starting point uh, is uh, to get uh, correspondence on the geometric sites between the coarse orbits. And this is done already by Jack and Rallis. They, they noticed that for every emission from H, there is a natural isomorphism between the base space A and AH, which is moreover sending regular semi-simple locus onto the regular semi-simple locus. And using this isomorphism, you can then define a notion of transfer that I immediately define I mean, in the global setting because I did not discuss the local one. So we'll say that two functions f prime and fh are transfer of each other, and I will denote this by a double arrow like this. If uh, the regular semi-simple orbital integral, so denoted by io and joh, as before, of these two test functions f prime and fh are equal for every uh, regular semi-simple coarse orbit, or this is now a real orbit because it's a regular semi-simple, on the linear side uh, mapping to, so an OH is the image of O by this isomorphism of Jack and Rallis, with the condition that the adelic points of OH is non-empty. So this is very natural, I mean, a very natural condition once you have this isomorphism in order to compare these two uh, relative trace formulas on the geometric side. And so now, but now if you want to do something with this definition, you need to know the existence of transfer. Uh, otherwise you cannot do it, you can do nothing. And actually, if you remember, so this regular semi-simple orbital integrals, these are essentially uh, local objects because they will decompose a, a product of local orbital integrals. These are Eulerian integrals. And um, 
Therefore, uh, this problem of the global transfer reduces to local problem. And this is something that was, so you have two problems actually. First, the existence of the local transfer, which is essentially defined in the same way, but locally. And this is one of the main achievement of Hui Zhang, proved it in the, for non-Archimedean places, and then the method it was extended by Eng Shui to Archimedean places. But you need slightly more, so you also need a fundamental lemma, which was proved actually even before by Zi Wei Yun in positive characteristic, and then extended by Julia Gordon to uh, characteristic zero. And once you have these two local ingredients, you get the existence of global transfer, saying that uh, for every test function f prime on the linear side, you can find a test function fh on the unitary side matching uh, f prime. And you can also go in the other direction. So now we can start to compare the two uh, relative trace formulas. So let me pick uh, Schwartz functions. So f prime on the linear side and fh on the unitary side. But now we need to consider all the isomorphism, I mean, all the rank n emission forms. So I let h run over all the uh, isomorphism classes of such emission forms. And so really on the unitary side, you are considering a upel of test functions. And of course, now you want to assume that f prime matches fh for all h. And this is something that can be achieved. For example, if you start from f prime, you can find for every h such a test function by the previous uh, result. And so starting with such uh, families of test functions, now you can uh, try to compare the geometric sites. And from the definitions, actually, you get essentially what you want, that is, the sum, so the geometric sides are the same, except that on the uh, unitary side, you have to sum over all possible emission forms. Uh, with the caveat that uh, from the definition, you get only, I mean, the equality between the contributions of the regular semi-simple orbits. It's not clear that you will get an equality where you consider all coarse orbits, including the singular one because the definition doesn't, I mean, doesn't include a condition for singular orbits. But actually, so uh, happily for us, this is a result of Chaudoir and Zidor, which is uh, far from trivial. When you have such families of test functions, then you also have the identities, the same identity as before, except now you sum over all coarse orbits. So really now you get an identity between the geometric sides of the, or two relative trace formulas, except that here you have to sum over all possible emission forms. And therefore you get now what you want, that is a spectral identity between the spectral sides. So between these two sums, and this is the result of the comparison. So I'm going to just write it again on the next slide because I'm going to refine this identity a little bit now. So now let's start with the uh, setting from the beginning. So fix a cuspid automorphic representation of some UH with a quadratic base change, capital pi, which is generic. And now let me denote by chi sub pi, the cuspidal datum uh, supporting, so to speak, uh, big pi. So big pi, yes. So there is a natural notion of supporting uh, automorphic representation for a cuspidal datum. For example, it means that pi will appear weakly in the piece of the L2 space indexed by chi pi. Anyway, so uh, now um, would like to uh, extract from this identity uh, something which can tell tells us about the can gross process conjecture. So it's not completely trivial, but turns out by a uh, or recent work with uh, Yifeng Yu, Wei Zhang, and Xin Wen Zhu, we can actually um, modify our original test function f prime and fh so that the original identity that I denoted by star becomes, now you, you can actually isolate in this identity certain contribution. And this will be really important for what we'll do later. And we'll end with this kind of identities where now on the unitary side, you only sum over, so over um, cuspidal data associated to cuspidal representations, sigma prime, in the same L packet as sigma. So with the same quadratic base change. 
So really, you are considering the same cuspidal automorphic representations as in the conjecture of gangrove fossil on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you just have the contribution of this cuspidal datum chi pi. OK, so this is the, now the final result of the comparison we'll work with. And uh, for the purpose of, so I will now illustrate uh, what we can do with this identity in the case when capital pi is cuspidal. So where the conjecture was proved in this uh, paper with Yifeng Liu, Wei Zhang, and Qin Wenzhou in order to explain uh, what is missing when pi is not cuspidal and what should be done. Okay, so first we can analyze the left-hand side uh, without assuming that pi is cuspidal. So if you go back to the definitions, uh, it's relatively easy to see that this distribution J sigma prime is given by a sum of this form where we sum over some uh, suitable autonomous basis of the representation sigma prime. R of FH is the action by right convolution of FH, and this PH is the original gangrove passage period. So uh, using this uh, expression for J sigma prime is relatively straightforward to see now that the left-hand side of this identity double star is non-zero precisely when there exists uh, H emission form and sigma prime cuspidal representation of UH, whose base change is capital pi and on which the uh, gangrove passage period is not vanishing. So this is exactly the second condition in the gangrove passage con uh, conjecture. So, uh, okay, so if we can prove that the non-vanishing of the right-hand side is equivalent to the first condition of this conjecture, then it will be done. And this is something that we can do relatively easily when capital pi is cuspidal. Because in this case, also this distribution i chi pi is relatively easy to compute. It's given exactly by the same kind of formulas, except you have a one force here, which is coming uh, roughly from the center of uh, the group uh, G. But otherwise you just sum again over some autonomous basis and you have here the period, so the automorphic period over H, and here the automorphic period over the subgroup G prime to state by eta prime. And as it turns out, and this is part of the original idea of uh, Jack and Radis, I guess, these two periods have been well studied and uh, we know something. So we know, for example, that the period over H is non-zero precisely when the central value of the Ankiselberg function is non-zero. This is for, for this follows from work of Jackie Piasetsky, Shapiro, and Sharika on the Rankin Selberg period. And on the other hand, this period has been studied by uh, Flicker and Rallis. And from their work, we know that this is always non zero on uh, automorphic composition, I mean, on the pi when pi is the base change of some sigma, which is the case here. So from this, we see that now when pi is cuspidal, also the right, right hand side is non vanishing if and only if the central value of the Rankin-Selberg function is non-zero. So this gives you the gangrove passage conjecture in this case. But when pi is not cuspidal, in order to effectively uh, apply this comparison identity, uh, we'll need to further analyze uh, the right-hand side because we don't know what it is equal to uh, a priori. We cannot compute it uh, as easily as in the cuspidal case. And so this is, so I, I'm going to now, from now on discuss only this problem. And this is uh, the main uh, achievement of our paper is to compute this. So as I will explain shortly, uh, the kind of cuspidal data that we get here are of a very special type. And I would like to discuss which special properties it satisfies and that we'll use later. And before this, let me just, I, I think it's a good time to recall the notation, if you forgot them. So let me recall, so now we'll purely work on the linear side. So G is the product of Gn and Gn plus one, where I have set Gk to be Glk over E, restricted uh, after and then take, taking restriction of scalar to F, and uh, G prime K denotes Glk over F, and eta prime of K is this quadratic character of G prime. And a convenient notation for us will be this one. So when pi is a cuspidal automorphic representation of some GLK over E, we're done by, denote by pi star 
the conjugate dual representation. So you apply the, take the dual representation and compose it with a, a conjugation for the extension. Okay, so now okay, some definitions. So a cuspidal datum of uh, GK will be said to be star generic if it's associated to a pair M pi of the following form. So M is a Levy of some uh, GLK, so it will be a product of GL or general linear groups, let's say GK1 up to GKR, and pi will uh, decompose accordingly as a tensor product of cuspidal automorphic representations pi i. And so it will be said to be star generic if the pi i are distinct and uh, conjugate self dual. And second definition will say that pi k is distinguished if uh, it can be represented uh, again as such a pair where the pi i satisfies this condition that a certain SIL function, the one of sine minus one to the k plus one, to be precise, has a pole at one. And this is equivalent to say, uh, according to Flickr, that the period over the subgroup G prime of the correct crank, twisted by this character, eta prime of K, yes, uh, is non-zero on pi i. So this explains why I call them distinguished. So, okay. And, um, Right, so this is for the group G L K of E, and for the group G, you can make the same definition where a cuspidal datum of G is just a pair of a cuspidal datum for G N, a cuspidal datum for G N plus one, and we say that such a cuspidal datum is star generic, or distinguished if each of these two cuspidal datum is. Okay. So and uh, also another definition. So it um, so if you have a star generic Cuspidal datum chi, it's easy to see that it can be represented by a pair m pi, where uh, pi is conjugate self dual. This, this follows from the definition directly. But actually, this pair is unique up to conjugation now. You, you, you cannot, if you twist pi, it will not be again conjugate self dual. And uh, therefore, the induced representation is uniquely determined by chi where well, I'm considering the normalized induction here, and they're not this by capital pi. And I call this the canonical base point of crack, this will be convenient. For me. And uh, to make the link with the previous identity, the, the fact is that from the work of Mock, Kaleta, Minges, Shin, and White, uh, generic automorphic representation capital pi of G uh, is the base change of some uh, auto cuspidal representation sigma prime of my group UH, of some UH, if and only if this is the canonical base point of some distinguished star generic uh, chi. So this is uh, why we'll be interested exactly in this kind of cuspidal data. Okay, so now I can state, I think, a first version of our main result with Chaudoin and Zidor. So let chi be a distinguished star generic cuspidal datum for G with canonical base point capital pi. And then there exists continuous functional that are written by pH star and pG prime eta prime star on big pi. And with the following properties. So the first one, so I should say that the star, so this looks like the notation, my notation for automorphic periods, but with a star and this is somehow to uh, convey the uh, idea that this should be considered as some uh, regularized periods. And actually they will satisfy similar properties as the periods, I mean the corresponding periods of uh, cuspidal representations. So first pH star is HA invariant. So this is just to, I mean, put this property to convince you that this is a generalization of the period. And it's also non-zero if you don't leave the central value of the rankin selbergel function is non-zero. And for the other one, this is G prime eta prime equivalent, sorry, and always non-zero for such uh, automorphic representation pi. And moreover, it should satisfy the same uh, condition as before. So it should decompose the uh, contribution of chi to the uh, flicker rayleigh trace formula as before in the same way. So this is exactly the same formula as for when pi was cuspidal, 
except I have to replace uh, the two periods by this kind of regularized periods. And uh, the power of two here has changed a bit. Also. So here R now denotes the rank of the uh, Levy subgroup or the class of Levy subgroups associated to the Catullo datum chi. And so one remark is that, uh, as I explained in the beginning, this R is also related to the cardinality of this finite group as sigma, so may, namely when pi is the basis of sigma, this over 2 to the R is precisely the cardinality. Uh, hello, uh, Raphael. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> I guess he's offline. Uh, yeah, we just wait for him to come yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's wait for a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, so I probably will stop recording and resume it again. Okay. How, how much time? Okay, we're going to resume the recording. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, how long was it? Because I, I am not know if I know. Um, uh, you talk about this pH prime and then the spec, I mean, the expansion of this i pi in terms of the usual formula. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. the previous one. Uh, yes, th this theorem, yes. Yeah. This one? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, so I didn't go much further. Sorry, so uh, let me go back. Like, yes, a little. So, did I describe this? Okay, so pH star and pg prime eta prime star. Okay. Uh, uh, right, so uh, I don't know if uh, this was uh, before the disruption, but so this, this, so the main result says that there exist such functionals. Right, uh, which satisfy uh, formally the same properties as uh, the corresponding automorphic periods when pi is class below, as we saw before. So these are uh, these have the right equivariance properties, and moreover, the first one, so the the Rankine-Selberg one, is non-zero precisely when the central value of the Rankine-Selberg function is non-zero, and the second one is always non-zero for uh, automorphic representation pi of this form. And they also satisfy the property that the uh, chi contribution to the trace formula of Jacquet and Rallis is the given in terms of these two distributions, I mean these two, sorry, functionals uh, in the same way as before, except uh, the power of two here has changed a bit. Now it's not one fourth, it's two to the minus r where R denotes the rank of the class of the Levy subgroup associated to chi. Okay, so this is the first version because this is not entirely uh, uh, precise, but at least uh, with the previous discussion, I hope to have convinced you that once you have this with these formal properties, then you can deduce the Ganvos process conjecture with the previous comparison identity. So few remarks is that uh, uh, this power of two uh, is exactly the power of two appearing in the Ichino Ikeda conjectures. So more precisely, this is the cardinality of this finite group as sigma when capital pi is the base change of sigma. Okay. And this is not a coincidence. This is how we get uh, a right power of two uh, out of our computations. Second remark, uh, to emphasize the difference with the cuspidal case is that uh, when pi is not cuspidal, then the chi part of the L2 space of uh, bracket G is actually uh, as a spectrum which is purely continuous, even not the center. Uh, but the above theorem is roughly telling you that the contribution of this chi to the Takeralis uh, trace formula is purely discrete. So there is some uh, difference between Originally, this is purely continuous, and at the end, it's purely discrete. And so, it cannot be uh, uh, completely, um, I mean, straightforward from the definition to get this. And 
last remark is that actually uh, in the paper we give two proof of this main theorem, uh, leading to two possible definitions to this of the of this uh, regularized periods. But uh, uh, happily, the two definitions eventually coincide, and this is also uh, something we put in the paper. So in the next slide, I will uh, give you the definitions of the two possible definitions for this regularized period. And then if I still have some time, I will try to explain the proof, uh, one of the two methods of proof. OK, so the first uh, way to define this uh, regularized uh, periods is to use uh, truncation operators. So let me set now some more notation that we use. So we write big pi as the induced representation of some cuspidal representation small pi from a certain parabolic subgroup P of G. Uh, and small pi is a representation of a Levy component M of P. And of course, up to conjugation, uh, for example, we can always take P to be standard. Then uh, up to conjugation, we may assume that the intersection of P and M with G prime, which are denoted by P prime and M prime, are again now parabolic subgroups and the Levy component of G prime distance. Okay. And uh, okay, so this is the how you can define the first regularized uh, period. This is the regularized flicker Alice period of a G prime eta prime. And okay, I should say uh, in, in this slide and the next one, uh, we we'll always see now capital pi. So using the automorphic realization of small pi, small pi is a cuspidal representation. You can see capital pi as a space of uh, as cuspidal forms on this uh, uh, slightly, I mean, this is not this, this on this quotient. So this is not quite the automorphic question, but this is the adelic points, more the rational points of the Levy and adelic points of the unipotent radical of P. So this is classical in the theory of uh, automorphic forms. Uh, you, have, you can also consider automorphic forms on quotients of this, this form. And so using this realization, now the, this regularized period is relatively easy to define. This is essentially given by uh, the so-called so um, local, uh, the, sorry, the integration of the closed orbit. So you integrate over G prime mod P prime of the Adels. Uh, this expression where the uh, P M prime eta prime, as the name suggests, is just the M prime uh, period of over M twisted by eta prime. And you have to mod by the speed center uh, on small pi now. And this is the right convolution and this is the right character. But this, this period inside here is non-zero on small pi, uh, precisely by the assumption that chi is distinguished, because it means that pi is distinguished by this m prime eta prime. And so this, this by its very definition, is non-zero also. And I put a one here to emphasize this is the, from the first set of definitions. Second, we can also define a, a, a regularized Rankin-Seibel period following each work of Ichino and Yamana. So more precisely, Ichino and Yamana, they define some truncation operators associated to parameters T as, uh, I mean, this is uh, leaving the same vector space as uh, for the truncated uh, space indexing the truncated Ziegel domains. So capital T, you can associate truncation operator, which transforms uh, functions of uniform model groups on G into functions of rapid decay on H. And so now for phi in our uh, representation big pi, you can form the Eisenstein series now, and it's going to be a function on this automorphic quotient of G. And you can apply to it the Ichino Yamana truncation operator and integrate it over H. And as it turns out, uh, this is independent of T as soon as the param uh, truncation parameter T is sufficiently dominant. And th this essentially follows from the property of key being distinguished again. And then we can we define the regularized period to be this integral. Okay. And moreover, uh, according to the Ichino and Yamana, this is something they proved also, this regularized period is uh, is H invariant and more importantly, it's non-zero precisely when the central value of the Ankin-Sepdagel function is non-zero. 
So it has the right properties. Okay, so now uh, I can define. Uh, so next slide, I will define uh, two other regularized periods in a different way. So the second way is to use zeta integrals. So I have to set more notation. Okay, so we denote by B the standard Borel of G. So recall that G is GLN times GLN plus one over E. And so B will be the product, this product, BN, BN plus one. Uh, where well, these are just the subgroups of upper triangular matrices. And we denote by N the uh, unipotent radical of B. And Psi will be a generic character of uh, bracket, I mean N of A, a trivial on rational points, which is also trivial on the intersections of N with the two subgroups G prime and H. But this is, for example, when you intersect with H, it just means that Psi N plus one, coincide on uh, an N, subgroup so intersection with GLN, with the inverse of Psi N. Okay, so to, we'll fix this. And then, uh, it will be important, we can associate with the uh, phi in big pi, a Whittaker function uh, in this way. So actually this is really, uh, this is defined in the usual way, but you apply, you take the Whittaker function actually of the Eisenstein series, E phi, but we don't, this by W phi, or short. Okay, so using this we take a function, now we can define two kind of zeta integral, uh, defined this way. And these are convergent, at least when the real part of S is sufficiently large, where S is a compact parameter. So the first one, we just integrate the uh, uh, we take a function over uh, the subgroup H, quotiented by NH, uh, times the determinant over S. This is just uh, this is just the, the uh, usual uh, rankin selberg as a time table because H is GLN and this is a with a function on GLN times GLN plus one. The second one is defined exactly the same way, more or less. So you integrate over G prime mod N prime, the with a function. Again, you have to twist. You put some determinant of power S, but you have also to plug there a Schwartz function. But because we are working with GLN times GLN plus one, this will really be a Schwartz function. So this uh, vector space of the Adel, so a n plus a n plus one, on which uh, uh, g prime is acting on the right on this vector space, and e n e n plus one are just the two uh, the last vectors in the standard basis of these two vector spaces. Okay, and this is essentially the usual uh, zeta integral studied by Flick and Rallis, except we have a copy for GLN and another one for GLN plus one. Okay, and uh, so it was studied, these two zeta integrals were studied by Jackie Piazeski, Shapiro, and Shalika on one end, and Flicker, Alice, and the other end. And what they prove, among other things, is that so uh, they can represent the uh, two L functions as a kind of GCD. And more precisely, for example, they say that when you take the quotient of these zeta integrals by, on the one end, the rankin selberg L function shifted by one half, and on the other end, a certain SI function, where well, this is the correct SI representation, the correct signs of G. Then you get uh, families of functionals which are uh, entire in the parameter S and nowhere vanishing. And so now uh, using these zeta integrals, we can define our two uh, regularized periods in different way. So with a two to indicate that this is the second definition. So for the regularized rankin selberg period, we just take this rankin selberg zeta integral and evaluate at zero. And so you see from this property that this quotient is entire, that this is non-zero precisely when the central value of the Ankin-Selberg function is non-zero. The second one is obtained by taking the flicker rallies uh, zeta integral and taking the leading coefficient in the Laurent, Laurent expansion at one. And so here you have to multiply by S minus one to the R where R is the order minus the order at S equal one of the SIL function by this uh, property. But it turns out that because chi is star generic and distinguished, you can show that this is the same as the rank of the Levy uh, uh, associated to chi. So the same R as uh, in the theorem. And you also have to choose an auxiliary test function, capital Phi, and uh, we just have to assume that it's a uh, Fourier transform is one at the origin. Okay, so this is the second set of definitions. 
And now we can state a, a more precise version. So this is the main, same theorem as before, theorem three, but uh, now it's saying that we have the same decomposition for the key part of the Jacquerelli trace formula as before, except we can choose for the regularized period, either uh, the one defined using truncation or the one using uh, defined using zeta integrals. Okay, so I'm already finished my time, but I have prepared a, a few more slides. So, uh, Lay? Uh, yeah, I think uh, for us, we are totally very happy. You can continue <laughs> if you okay. would like. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay. so now in the next uh, slides, uh, uh, I will try to give you an overview of the proof of this theorem. Uh, actually, there are two proofs, as I said. So one for the, each uh, set of, uh, because there are two different ways to define the realized periods also. And so I, I will just discuss one of these two. I do not have time to discuss both. And I will discuss the one using uh, zeta integrals. So uh, let me first uh, give you uh, an overview. So I recall what's the definition of this distribution I chi. This is given by integrating the key part of the kernel of F over this product of two groups, twisted by eta prime, but truncated uh, in one of the variables in the parameter t, and then you get exponential polynomial asymptotic to this expression, and then you take the constant term. This is basically how it's defined. Now actually, uh, what the proof will show is that uh, you can integrate this uh, kernel uh, in this order. So first, over the uh, rankine selbach subgroup H, and then over the flicker alice subgroup G prime, twisted by eta prime. And it will converge conditionally in that order, actually. And therefore, I mean, then from the definition, it's relatively easy to see that I chi of F will be just this iterated integral. It will be equal to this. And this, this will come out of the proof and we'll also compute this iterated integral. And uh, so before explaining how it works, let me, uh, just uh, precise that. So now you take this kernel function, project it to chi and fix one of the parameters. Then it's relatively easy to see that it's, you get a function. So you get a function on the automorphic quotient first. So that's because it's just the kernel is a function on G bracket times G bracket. But if you fix one of the two variables, it's relatively easy to see that it's uh, uh, rapidly decaying in the other variable. And so it's in the Schwartz uh, so-called I mean, Schwartz space of packet G. So where Schwartz functions means smooth functions which are rapidly decaying with all their uh, derivatives. I will not give a precise definition there. So this is one thing. And the other thing is that it's uh, supported on chi because we have projected onto chi. So it's it belongs to the intersection of the Schwartz space with the key part of the two space. So let me denote this by S chi. And uh, actually, we can also introduce another space of this functions, which is the, so I denote by T of G, space of functions on the automorphic quotients, which are of uniform moderate growth. So uh, again, uh, we'll not define this precisely, but uh, not going too fast and also uh, same condition for the derivative. And there is a sensible way to define its uh, key part, what is uh, an incaspidal datum. And then, so I can make this statement uh, uh, more precise. So actually now we need to consider the kernel function in both variables. And of course, when you are in both variables, it's not rapidly decaying in, in two variables at the same time because uh, otherwise everything would be convergent, which is not. But uh, at least if you uh, see it as uh, something which is rapidly decaying in one variable, then it will be of uniform moderate growth in the other variable. So in a loose sense, this kernel uh, function projected to chi will belong to this, uh, some, some kind of uh, completed tensor product like this, where on one end, you, in one variable, it will be of uniform moderate growth and uh, projected to chi, and in the other variable, it will be rapidly decaying and projected to chi. So we will not make precise sense of this, but it's just a motivation to, for what is to come. So in the next slides, we will first compute this integral of a g prime twisted by eta prime, so just the period, for a, a function phi, which is Schwartz on g and supported on chi. 
So phi here, I insist, is just a function on the automorphic quotient, but it's not eigenfunction in general. It's not automorphic form. And uh, we'll also do the same for phi in uh, now uh, of uniform modate goes on G and supported on chi. So we'll integrate over H. We'll have to make sense of this integral, and then we'll compute it also. And then I, I hope I have convinced you with this kind of rules belonging that once you have these two, then uh, it will allow you to show that this iterated integral is convergent and to compute it. And then, and then we give the previous theorem that I will not do the formal uh, deduction. Okay, so let me discuss each of these in turn. So first I discussed uh, what happens with the rankin selberg period. So uh, uh, there is a theorem. So the theorem is saying, so chi is, uh, as before, is star, generic, and distinguished. It's not true for all pedal data. So this linear form, so when you take a Schwartz function, you can always integrate it over H. There is no issue of convergence here. And when you restrict to the third space, uh, Schwartz space S chi, supported on chi, then it's, it, it, it turns out, so this is a theorem that it extends, this linear form extends by continuity to the space of uniform moderate growth, functions of uniform moderate growth, supported on chi. And so I did not the extension by pH star. So this is the first part, and it allows to make sense of this integral when phi now is a, of uniform moderate growth and supported on chi, as on the previous slide. And the second part of the theorem is telling you how to compute now this, this regularized period. And uh, so if you take any uh, phi, like uniform moderate growth, supported on chi, you can form this zeta integral. As before, this is the same as before. This is the rankin selberg zeta integral, where now you take W phi is the Whittaker function of phi, but it, it makes sense even if phi is of uniform the growth. And uh, even when phi is of uniform the growth, it's still convergent in some right half plane. This is relatively easy to see. And the point is that, so this is going to extend to an entire function, to, to something, a uh, function which is entire on the whole complex plane. And then this regularized period would just be given by the value at zero of this rankin selberg function, uh, this rankin selberg zeta function. And this makes the relation with zeta function. Okay, so let me explain now uh, some ideas from the proof of this. So uh, it is inspired from the usual rankin selberg unfolding, which says that if this phi is a cusp form, then uh, you can relate directly the period with the rankin selberg zeta integral, so more precisely, when you twist the period by the determinant to the power s, the usual unfolding tells you that this is equal to the zeta uh, integral, at least on some right of plane. Uh, so actually, the process of unfolding, you can try to apply it in a similar way to any uh, Schwarz. So for, for the moment, I only consider Schwarz functions on G. But if phi is not a cusp form, uh, you will not get precisely this equality. So you can apply the same thing, uh, I mean, formally the same process, but you will end up with more terms that are called boundary terms uh, because phi is not a cusp form that will not necessarily manage. But if you compute these boundary terms that are uh, indexed by parabolic subgroup of G of this, of, of, with a Levy factor of this form, so GLK and GLN minus K. So this is in, in product of two maximal parabolics uh, uh, with block of size k and minus k on one end and k n plus one minus k on the other end. And besides uh, this uh, boundary terms, they involve integrating the constant term of phi along this parabolic subgroup over uh, the diagonal uh, block gk uh, sitting inside the product here. So this is a kind of taking a Peterson in a product now of the constant term. I'm very loose here, but uh, this is basically the idea. And now the point is that if chi is distinguished, then uh, so you decompose it as a chi n, chi n plus one, because all data of GLN and GLN plus one. Uh, then the cuspidal support of chi n and chi n plus one are, so to speak, cuspidal support. So the, the set of all cuspidal representations in the, in the equivalence classes. And, and then you, 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 I mean, you decompose them as tensor product of uh, cuspid representations of general linear groups. So this gives you a set of such. But these are disjoint. So this is very important. And since these are disjoint, the Peterson in a product of, uh, 
here, they, they will automatically vanish so, somehow. And so this extracts 10 are just zero. And so you get these identities also to, you know, a setting. So we get this. And I found this as in the usual case, then you, you deduce at once that uh, the right hand side has holomorphic continuation because the left hand side has. And that you have a functional equation of this form. And this is all for phi uh, Schwartz function. But, but, but now, uh, using a fragment Lindelof principle, you can uh, just take the value at zero and you can bond it in terms of uh, the value of this zeta integral applied to W phi and this function W phi tilde for argument uh, S, which are of very large real part. But as I say, this makes sense when phi is uh, of uniform moderate growth. And so you can bound this in terms of something that you can control even for functions of uniform moderate growth. And then you can deduce that this linear form when you evaluate at zero, which is the same as the H period, extends by continuity to uh, this space of uniform moderate growth function. With the, and, and then you get also the rest of the theorem. But, uh, okay, this is basically the idea. Uh, okay, I'm already 10 minutes uh, over time. Uh, I still have uh, one slide and a half to show. Should I continue later? Or? Yes, okay. I think it's okay. okay. It's up to yeah. you. Continue, please. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so in, uh, now this is for, uh, so this, this one is somehow the easy, the easy, the one, uh, the other one needs uh, slightly more input, as I will explain. So this this was for the Rankin Selberg period, and uh, for the uh, flicker rallies period, as I said, now we don't need to consider uniform modal growth functions, but we need to compute it for uh, spectra. <laughs> I guess it's. Uh... Offline again. Hello. Okay, uh, let's wait a few minutes. Sorry. Sorry, you went offline again. Uh, yes, 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 yeah. yes, yeah. Uh, I don't know what is happening. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I guess I stopped there. Uh, yes. Okay, so not now in the remaining uh, slide, I would like to discuss this problem of computing spectrally. This um, flicker Alice period uh, for a Schwarz function on the automorphic Gaussian supported on Chi. But as I, so I was saying, but I don't know if you hear me. Uh, this is uh, essentially the situation is a product of a situation of a, for n and for n plus one. So this is GLN times GLN plus one. Uh, and this just reduces to computing this period for uh, GLN or GLN plus one. Where now you replace the, this period by the usual Rankin uh, Jack Flicker Alice period, where you integrate over GLK over F twisted by this uh, small quadratic character, eta prime of K. And now phi is not uh, on G, it's on GLK over E, and it's supported on chi n or chi n plus one, which is the component of chi. So chi n or chi n plus one is with my previous definition also star generic and distinguished. Okay, and so for this, again, we mimic uh, some uh, computations that has been done for cast forms, and this one has been considered by Flicker and Alice. So we start as they started. So by representing the period as a residue, so uh, this is a residue of this uh, integral. Oh, oh, I forgot the character here, but anyway. 
So you integrate the function phi against some uh, Epstein-Eisenstein series, which is uh, constructed from the Schwartz functions. Uh, this is where the Schwartz function is coming in. And th this is Epstein-Eisenstein series. This is defined in the usual way. You, you sum over uh, rational points in your vector space, uh, except the origin. And then, uh, so it gives you a, automorphic, uh, sorry, a function on the automorphic quotient, and then you, 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 you integrate against some uh, character. And uh, uh, then th it's well known that this Agenson series has a residue at s equal one, uh, which is equal to the Fourier transform of phi at zero, but we'll set it to be one for simplicity. And so that this formula is true now, because you take just the residue inside of the Agenson series. And um, okay, so these steps works uh, quite generally. We can do it for any Schwartz functions. And then we will do again an unfolding. So following Flicker and Rallis, they did unfold this expression and show that it is equal to uh, some zeta integral. So the same as before, associated to the Whittaker function of phi and this uh, Schwartz function capital phi. But once again, since phi is not a cost for you, we get more terms, these boundary terms. And this time they will not vanish, but uh, actually we can show that these boundary terms will not contribute to the pool at s equal one, and so we are safe. So for the purpose of taking the residue, we can just ignore these boundary terms. So we just get now that the uh, period we're interested in for a uh, uh, Schwarz function is the residue of this family of flicker zeta integrals. Uh, okay, and now we have to compute this. Uh, I mean, this is not the end of the story. We have to compute this uh, spectrally. So for this, we'll use the spectral decomposition of phi. And uh, thanks to the particular form of the uh, cuspidal datum chi, this spectral decomposition then thanks to the following form. So it will be, <coughs> if I can say, supported only on one component, the component associated to the original cuspidal datum. So k, so k chi, sorry, is my cuspidal datum, and I'm writing it as a uh, equivalence class of the pair m k pi k. This i of a star m k stands for the group of unitary and ramified characters, uh, automorphic and ramified characters of this m k. And uh, and this is a group which is isomorphic to a product of copies of i to the r, and you have r copies of it, where r is the rank of the Levy, right? R is always the rank of the Levy. And this now curly, so sorry, I, I just not realized that I'm using the letter phi far too many times. So you have this, uh, so this thread phi is the Schwarz function. This big phi, sorry, is Schwarz function on G. Big phi is the Schwarz function on the vector space, A n. And curly phi now is a automorphic representation, uh, automorphic form. So this lambda, this phi lambda is an automorphic form living in this induced representation. We twist pi k by lambda. And one very important property about this transform is that this is Schwartz in a suitable sense. So I the decaying with the derivative. This is a result which is uh, due to lapid. So we'll see in one moment why it is uh, important. So we, we take this spectral decomposition and then it's relatively easy to see that the formation of this flicker rallis zeta integral, they, uh, 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 in loose sense, they commute with the spectral decomposition, at least when uh, the real part of S is sufficiently large. Uh, there is no analytic difficulty in this uh, range. So we get this spectral decomposition of the flicker rallis uh, zeta integral of the Whittaker function of phi. In terms of the flicker rallis zeta integrals, associated to the Whittaker function of, so recall that this is the Whittaker function of the Eisenstein series associated to this phi lambda. And we need now to compute the residue of this integral. But now flicker rallis has uh, um, described more or less what, uh, I mean, they have studied this as uh, the integrals and uh, they, sh I mean, from uh, their work, we deduced that the poles of these zeta integrals, when you plug in uh, some automorphic form, 
a good function. These are controlled by the uh, some SIL function, the pulse or some SIL function at S equal one. And so, uh, since our CRISPR uh, datum is star generic and, and distinguished, we can describe exactly what are the pulse actually of this uh, kind of SIL functions. And uh, in the right, I explain when the real part of S is greater or equal to one. Uh, the poles are only at s equal lambda i plus one, where the lambda i are the uh, uh, sorry the this is the when you decompose lambda in a standard basis of this group of n ramified characters, these are the components of lambda. Okay. So purely imaginary numbers. Okay, so using this now you can control what are the pole of this uh, function in s. And uh, uh, when the real part of S is greater to or equal to one, which is what we need. So this implies that more or less near S equal one, this zeta integral. So now I consider it as a function of S and lambda. This is of the form. So you have a product of S minus lambda I minus one inverse. This corresponds to the pole at this point times something which is a smooth function and Schwarz in lambda. So Schwarz comes from the result of Lapine. And using this, then uh, okay, I'm teaching just a bit actually, but uh, because I'm not taking really care of the center. But from this, this identity earth earth, uh, it's easy to deduce. Uh, I mean, to compute this residue now, and it's given by uh, the this uh, expression where you take the leading uh, coefficient in the lowering expansion of the zeta integral at one, but at the central point lambda equals zero and times a power of two, which is the same as before. But this is exactly the regularized period I define uh, using zeta integrals uh, for phi zero, where phi zero is in this representation big pi in this index k, which is uh, more, more or less the same big pi as before. This is the canonical bus point. So we really end up, so this is really more or less an exercise in a, a classical real analysis. When you have this kind of families of uh, uh, Schwarz functions, then you, you, when you take the residue of the integral, you just get a contribution from zero. Okay, sorry uh, for going over time. I will stop there. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much. It's a very comprehensive talk.